yeah, good morning, everybody. Happy to have you here to our webinar uh, today about uh, venture capital or corporate venture capital uh, in China. Uh, as you know, we have uh, two Chinese speaker here, Bobby Chu and uh, Yang Chong. Uh, both are very much familiar with the venture capital uh, industry in China. And I'm today I'm here with Professor Bauke. And uh, Professor Bauke is a professor of digitalization and entrepreneurship and head of the Venture Lab at the UA UAS uh, University of uh, Aschaffenburg. And uh, the reason why he is here, because we are cooperating in this project about venture capital uh, in China. Uh, uh, Boris will in a second a little bit more explain about the background of the project. Basically, it's about uh, venture capital as a tool for innovation. And actually, the project is sponsored by the Federal Ministry, Ministry of Education uh, and Research under the background to have more China know-how on the one side, but also under the background, maybe there's something to learn for Europe and for Sherman, Germany, especially with regards to venture capital and uh, innovation. Uh, the procedure is as always, um, after the introduction of Professor Bauke, we hand over to our Chinese participant. They have both prepared, thanks to that, the PowerPoint presentation and give then uh, an overview about venture capital from different uh, perspective. And after that, I guess we will have around a half an hour a Q and A session. As always, you are most welcome to type in um, your question in the in the in the chat. Uh, last but not least, I should mention we record the first part of this webinar. That means all this, this, the speeches, introductions, uh, uh, statements, but we are not recording the discussion, so feel free for your question. And having said that, uh, I'm very happy to, to hear with Boris today. So Boris, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, Horst already mentioned that we are conducting a joint research project between our two institutions. Um, we look at venture capital as a strategic tool. So mainly strategic driven actors that engage in venture capital as opposed to purely financial driven actors. That also uh, coincides with why we already um, heard we use the term corporate venture capital frequently, because that is a strategic organization that has goals, uh, innovation goals to achieve with, uh, with the venture capital activities. Um, while corporate venturing is not really a new topic, it has been around since the late 70s, um, it mainly emerged in the US and in Europe. And there's very sparse literature about corporate venture capital in China, even though it's uh, empirically a very strong contributor to corporate VC activity. And that's the reason why we started this project. Um, in 2022, corporate backed VC activity globally accounted for about 19% of all deals, of all venture capital deals that were happening. And that is up from um, around 13% over the previous decade, um, because corporate venture capital has been more robust um, than VC um, in the current uh, funding downturn. And China is one of the leading drivers in that sphere. Um, number one is US, number two is Japan, and then comes already China driving uh, venture or corporate backed venture deals. Um, our idea or motivation for the project was that we experienced China as a master of innovation, meaning bringing technologies to markets and also creating market leading companies um, in that process like Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, uh, BYD and the like. Uh, China also has a very particular institutional landscape, not just because of those big tech companies that were created in a relatively fast time in China, but also because of its large state owned enterprises and uh, um, rather strong government guidance on the technological growth eras. While China has a very um, impressive innovation track record, looking back the last few decades, probably the most or one of the most impressive ones in, in human history, we're currently also seeing some cracks with the um, geopolitical and geoeconomical challenges that come around, um, specifically 
uh, induced by the China-US tech decoupling. Um, one may think of the chip wars or um, um, other re export restrictions. Um, I learned throughout the interviews that we conducted in our project that there is a local nickname for those technologies called choking technologies, which I found interesting. Um, so there, there is a lot of um, interventions going on in the tech industry. Everybody is aware of the Ant Financial Jack Ma story. Um, and we also see, uh, that's what we learned in our interviews, a shift in the VC activity in China um, from mainly consumer uh, focused applications to more B2B and industrial applications, um, which might or might not be related to um, the before said uh, tech decoupling. For sure, um, we're all aware that there's great um, opportunities on the other hand, not just the challenges. If you look at global growth contributions of China to the global economy, uh, number one and number two, specifically into the sectors that are very interesting for a German audience, um, B2B industry, also automotive. If you think about uh, BYD surpassing Volkswagen as the most um, selling uh, car brand in, in China. So there's a lot of momentum and that's why we thought this webinar might be quite interesting for a German speaking audience or a European based audience uh, to learn more about how is corporate venture capital um, implemented in, in, in China to drive innovation. Uh, we're very happy to have speakers from the front lines here, which can bring into different perspectives. One perspective more from the investor side. Um, managing a VC fund, the other perspective more from a limited partner, so a large corporation investing into a, a venture capital vehicle. Um, and um, if any of the participants would be interested in later on joining a, a, a Sino-European venture capital community, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards on, on LinkedIn or your preferred channel. So I'll give a brief introduction um, for the two speakers, and then we dive right into it. Um, both speakers have extensive experience um, in industrial innovation and uh, a corporate VC background. Um, we start with the first one, um, Robbie Hsu. Uh, Robbie started his career as a, a government official um, and then moved into the private sector in Shanghai. Um, he gained uh, extensive work experience with different multinational corporations. Uh, first Relics Group, um, formerly Reed Elsevier, um, so a, a British now, British-Dutch um, multinational information um, and analytics company. He also worked for uh, Sto, which is a, a kind of a hidden champion in, in Germany, in Baden-Württemberg, um, in the um, buildings material space, so building insulation materials, for instance. Um, he then uh, moved on to Bayer Material Science, now Covestro, stayed there for a very long time, um, over 13 years, I believe, um, later on managing or heading their open innovation activities for the whole APEC region. Um, he later on went on to uh, co-fund um, a multi-corporate VC fund called Richland Capital with um, limited partners such as Henke, um, Sargobin, or BASF. And most recently, um, Robbie joined uh, Mojia Bio, a synthetic biology company that aims to revolutionize uh, the way that um, chemical manufacturing is happening. And they just recently uh, closed their uh, Series A round of 100 million RMB. Um, Robbie has a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a postgraduate diploma in uh, applied finance. Our second speaker, um, Yang um, has also a lot of experience in the industrial sphere. He um, started his career in the United States as a research engineer for a material science de department of Saint-Gobain. Um, he later on moved back to China, um, joining another uh, American uh, material science company, uh, Rogers Corporation, um, transitioning into the innovation management sphere. Uh, and then um, in 2020, he joined British American Tobacco, so another um, international corporation as head of open innovation for Asia. In that function, he also manages um, the LP investments into VC funds. 
Um, Yang holds a, a bachelor's degree in material science from, from Shanghai Jiatong University and a PhD uh, in material science from University of Connecticut, where he also received uh, several recognitions and, and fellowships for his outstanding work. So we're very pleased to have both of you here um, bringing in different perspectives that might be of very high relevancy to uh, a German audience. So I would hand over to you, Robbie, now. Um, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you so much, Boris. Uh, let me share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning in Europe and good afternoon in China. I'm not sure good day to someone, uh, someone else in the world. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much to the to Horace, uh, to the event organizer, for having me here, and it's uh, it's truly my great honor uh, to give this short presentation and the panel uh, discussion about the CVC and IVC in China as a tool for driving innovation. Um. Yeah, actually, I have prepared one slide about uh, about my uh, uh, self introduction. But thanks to the nice words uh, made by by uh, by Boris, yeah. So um, maybe uh, on top of all those nice words, I can I can uh, just highlight some few about me about myself very quickly. Yeah, firstly, I have a twenty three year of working experience in the industry, including government agency. Uh, uh, copy the innovation, uh, copy the CVC, and uh, also uh, financial VC. Uh, and now my current company named Moja Bio, and this company is, uh, uh, you know, is one of the portfolio company of my previous uh, company, uh, say Richland Capital. So I invested in this company, so now I joined this company as a full-time employee. <laughs> um, so now I'm the senior vice president, and a senior vice president at the Moja Bio company. And this company actually is a startup company. Yeah, it's a fast growing and product focused bio manufacturing company uh, committed to uh, sustainability and a circular bioeconomy, uh, in particular specialized in uh, biochemicals development. Uh, so basically you can see in my career, uh, I have the government agency, I have the corporate, uh, 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 also uh, CVC and then I, uh, financial VC, uh, so-called independent VC, or we say IVC, and now startup. <laughs> Thank you. So um, uh, first of all, let's you know talking about innovation in China. Uh, very often, the people always ask uh, why China. Yeah, as also uh, um, there's some very not very nice words from uh, Boris already. Uh, as you know. Or maybe you still don't know yet. Uh, China is now becoming an innovation powerhouse globally. Uh, from the left side, you can see in nowadays actually China is already uh, on a leading position in terms of both publications and the patents for industry 4.0 frontier technology and uh, a green green uh, frontier uh, frontier technology. And the second player uh, for other frontier technologies. Meanwhile, China is now the biggest economy for electric vehicles export, solar PV export, uh, electric vehicle uh, sport, uh, wind power, uh, wind power production, uh, bioenergy production, as well as solar power production in the world. So what does it look like the China's startup ecosystem? Uh, this is a quite complicated graphic picture here, but it simply indicates the relation and the uh, rationale behind about China's startup ecosystem. Generally speaking, comparing to the startup ecosystems in US or EU, the one in China is, mu is much more different. Basically, China's startup ecosystem is ecosystem within ecosystem. 
you can see those developer startups who are now becoming large corporates or industrial giants who love to acquire or develop their own those startups uh, or set up their those startup clusters around their core business in line with their own business strategy. Talking about taking Alibaba for example, started from e-commerce business many years ago, and now its portfolio covers everything around people's living, like food, uh, traffic, education, financing, even donation, and so on. Um, WeChat actually is another example, for lack of a better word, it's a super app. It's a Swiss army knife to be easily does everything for all of us in China. WeChat is a all purpose, multifunctional super app that is revolutionizing how consumers interact with the mobile internet. With 272 million monthly users, WeChat is not only a rival to Google or and uh, WhatsApp, it's turned into the extended operating systems of China's mobile millions. By the way, maybe you know already, living in China, so now basically we are living in a, a cash, cashless uh, world. For me, I haven't used a single cash, Chinese cash for more than maybe six or seven years now. In corresponding to financial VC or independent VC, we call IVC. Corporate VC, say CVC, is now playing an essential role in helping uh, corporate venture into new uh, territories in China. The right picture indicates how we do corporate innovation at a large organization. Basically, we run it by a holistic approach, including open innovation plus CVC plus MA. As, as you all know, we need a tool package for engaging with startups, just like the picture on the right side indicates. Basically, CVC or running LP or running LP in IVC fund is the most powerful approach. Taking, uh, talking about the approaches we have, we have, uh, talking about the approaches we have, how we could engage with startups. There are six typical ones, uh, including selling, selling, uh, selling the startups to, uh, to future giants or you know, external solutions to internal needs or for the large of, uh, for the corporate and find and uh, bring new solutions uh, from outside in approach and ecosystem engagement. So corporate reach out to the startups through the you know, ecosystem hub and then also running the venture capital uh, by, you know, by the share holding, share with the startups directly. And the last one is entrepreneurship in residence. So basically to incubation for uh, entrepreneurship uh, within the company, within the organization. So within, within this uh, approach, you can see the venture capital is the only one way that, it, that it will ensure the corporate to engage with startups in depth. The others, that all our the others are of corporate purpose only. So this is the reason why we would we will see we venture capital with so put so high position within within many many organizations. However, there are also a number of challenges for CVC to drive innovation independently, such like maybe many of you of you are familiar with this already. So just like uh, um, how can we realize internal synergy yeah, for the strategic thing? Actually, sometimes it's so difficult for CVC function to make the final decision. 
against the so many stakeholders around us for one single deal. And uh, yeah, on the other hand, it's, uh, uh, it's the efficiency of decision making, as I mentioned already. And then, um, for, for example, at the code, uh, I mean, that's, uh, how can we realize the uh, performance driven by stimulation for those TVC team, team members? Yeah, how can we make sure the risk uh, tolerance within the organization? Again, somebody mean in the middle, you can see, uh, uh, in, in the outer one, you can see the IVC, say the financial VC or independent VC, they, much, they have much, much more freedom to operate. So on the contrast, we can see it's easy for the IVC to, take, to tackle those challenges for CVC into home strategies. This is the reason why for CVC, we need to collaborate with IVC for driving innovation internally and externally. In order to share more insights about why the collaboration uh, between and how the collaboration between CVC and, and the as IVC uh, is needed, I would like to explain more by this slide here. Uh, so you can see from the um, purpose, from the topic of key objectives, actually CVC is more, much more focused on the strategic value creation for the you know, and, but the financial VC is definitely focused on the. Uh, uh, return or investment. And then they also have different investment uh, term or horizon. Uh, so basically CVC is much more uh, focusing on medium term or long term uh, 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 targets. But meanwhile, we see they also have, they, there's a very limited uh, term for a single week, for single fund, basically 10 to 10, 10 to 10, uh, seven to 10 years. And then governors, then evaluated and the fund management incentives, uh, basically they also have different approaches. Yeah. Due to the matter of time, I, I don't want to go through in detail. Uh, here you can see the specific approaches for CVC and IVC to collaborate. So basically you can see on the right side, they are uh, in the, uh, indirect way and then direct way, yeah. In the other way, the, the means they have the, the VC just invest uh, the IBCVC just invest money to external pool the fund or dedicated fund. Uh, the other way means um, the CVC set up set up their own fund. Then working with the BUs or new medical divisions within the organization to invest uh, external deals, external startups directly. Moreover, we also see some change or new change, like more and more CVC would like to set up their own funds from being a little LP to a GP or a co GP. Here is another example about the BSF who just, who just launched a new fund in China as a co GP with a Chinese company named Red Avenue recently specialized in new materials investment. CVC play an increasing important role in catalyzing changes and accelerating innovation. And now more and more multinational companies and uh, local Chinese companies are joining together, joining this uh, CVC community. You can see more details here uh, on the right, on the left, left side. So uh, the uh, the CVC, uh, you know, the CVC uh, contribution of CVC to the uh, corporate innovation accounts more than 60%. Yeah. On the right side, you also can see the more and more uh, the, in the increasing of the number of the investment number uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Asia over the, uh, over, the, over the years. Here, I would like to give you some uh, brands who are very actively or successfully running CVC in China. On the left side is uh, multinational company CVCs uh, in China for different sectors or segments, uh, like chemical materials, uh, like energy, uh, like a semiconductor or electronics. And on the right side, actually, it's, uh, it's a big number, it's a big scope, a big range of, 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 of brands, including multinational companies, as well as local 
uh, Chinese companies. And you also can see some uh, incubator names there. No, this is something about the ecosystem. No one single can drive innovation or do a uh, startup engagement project by their own. And meanwhile, China is China's P, uh, you know, private equity and the venture capital market is, is growing significantly over the years. Currently, actually, my, my, my understanding, China is now number two, the second largest PEVs market in the world. Uh, sorry, Boris. <laughs> we believe the you know, um, allocation to China PP or VC can add a value within a broader global PE and VC portfolio by enhancing returns and the diversification. All in all, this is China here is also very important, uh, also a highland for corporate to drive innovation. Last but not least, I wanted to say one sentence to all of you here today. Most people will not change when they see the light, but it will change when they feel the heat. So come over to China, you will feel the heat, you will feel the heat, and then let's drive the innovation. Thanks very much. Having said that, I would like to hand over my stage to Dr. Zhong for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Xu, for your insightful uh, presentation. Very interesting in, indeed to learn more about uh, also the concrete uh, situation in China. I'm sure there will be a variety of questions later especially about the link of venture capital and innovation. And I now hand over to Dr. Chong, and um, um, uh, he will um, discuss the question of venture capital or corporate venture capital in China a little bit more from the perspective of LP. So, uh, Yang, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. Very nice to, to, to see you and uh, talk with you later today. So after Robin has mentioned a lot about the things in China, see my part will be much easier. Like being a multinational company, we want to answer several questions. First question is, do we want to have a VC or CVC in China? Like what kind of values do VC or CVCs can deliver to multinational companies? And if we want to do that, where should we set up in China? So these are the questions I'm going to talk about. But before that, I'll give you a very brief introduction of myself. So I have a back, background mostly in material science, then working in French, American, and British companies. Now I'm living in Shanghai. And uh, actually, Ruben and I know each other because we both live in Shanghai. And we basically, we work closely with the VCs or CVCs in the ecosystem in China and somehow build a network so here's a little bit about my introduction. I'm going to, to change my topic to, to, to the topic today. So the first question is, do we want, or we, do we need a VCs for multinational companies in China or not? I think the answer is yes. And that's one of the reasons you attend this webinar today. My rationales are quite simple, which at least is three bullets here. First one is that China is the second largest VC market in the world. And we also have very strong national focus that specialize in hard tech, innovation on materials, and also uh, advanced manufacturing. The second thing is uh, China, I think, as most of you know, if you work for multinational companies, China is a market that you can't ignore. We have 1.4 billion people, and we have very big size of medium class. So China itself is a very big market. The third part is, as Boris mentioned earlier today, China's changing from a manufacturing engine to an engine that can combine innovation and manufacturing. And talking about innovation engines, China has a very dynamic ecosystem with a lot, lot of startup companies in many sectors. And here just leads three sectors, which I think they performed amazing in the past five to 10 years. For example, the tech sector, as Robin mentioned, we have WeChat, we have Alibaba, Second one is energy sector. If we talk about battery, CATL is one of the biggest battery manufacturer now in China, not only in China, but for the whole world. Third one is uh, we have to talk about automotive sector. As Boris mentioned earlier, BYD is now number one automotive manufacturer in China. For the first time, it surpasses our German friends Volkswagen. So as you can see, China is really leading the innovation. 
for some parts of the, the tech energy automotive sectors. So coming back, what's the takeaway for this slide is I think VCs could be a very effective channel and bridge for the big corporates to the dynamic startup ecosystem in China. And we need we really need to have VCs or CVCs in China for this big corporate. The second question is like, okay, now we want we need a VC or we need a CVC. What values do VCs or CVCs can deliver to multinational companies? Because we are companies, eventually we need values to be delivered to the companies. I'll give you two, I'll give you, I'll talk about this question in two parts. The first part is I think the CVCs and VCs is a very important part for the company to establish its a pipeline, not only on technology, but also on the future product or commercialization. The left part is about what kind of things you want to make, what kind of products we want to make, what do we want to really want to commercialize. The, the figure on the right is talking about like what technology you want to, 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 to really develop in the, in the next years. So let's talk about the figure on the left first. Assuming a company, you won't have innovations and you won't have these innovations to help you to conquer new markets, right? That's why you want, that's why we often need innovation. If we somehow distinguish the type of innovations into like incremental innovation or the big disruptive innovations, some for internal incremental innovations, I think our internal R&D teams probably can do that. But if you talk about something beyond current what we're making today, or something is currently fully beyond our business model, it's something fully new for the company, and we think there's big opportunities. One of the good approaches probably to set up a VC or CVC, or utilize a model called open innovation, which Robin already mentioned, I don't want to repeat. But basically the idea is use VC or CVCs to test the market and also to absorb the innovations from ecosystem already there. You don't need to set up everything. You just need to set up a fund or be an LP or fund or partner with many companies to absorb the best innovation and find the best commercialization route for this company. Then you can really grab the opportunities and be the leader ahead of other companies to conquer the market as well as own the, own the innovation. So here is like the VCs or CVCs that can really help you on the commercialization rules for new innovations. Second part is uh, as a big corporate, I think we all need something called product map or technology map. And when we talk about this, like something we we'll always debate within the companies, like do we want to deliver this technology by ourselves or do we want to do it outside? If we want to do it outside, do we want to have some exclusivity or do we have a, what we call locked partnership, strong partnership bounded by investment or some other contract? Or we won't have a loose relationship like we call open source. I think the, I think it's really a case by case decision. But what we think is when we made the decision several years ago, here's basically our logic. We think if it's something with a significant value for the company, we want either doing it internally, if we can do it, for the most cases we can't. That's something we need. We want to lock the partnership. We want to have exclusivity. And CVC, OP Innovation, is a very good approach to achieve that. Because by investing into a company, you can have some, you can, you can have some control on the company. You can also help the company to grow, to, have to let the technology to be fully somehow connected to your company. And you can also to help the company grow much faster for that technology to help your company grow in that specialized field. And if something not that important, and it's a market already a lot of competition, not much innovation, we'll use something we call open source or loose partnership. And for that part, we probably CVC don't want to get involved too much, but it doesn't, it doesn't really bring too much strategic value. So, so the overall deliver, delivery for this slide is, I think the CVCs can deliver, we see our services can deliver values to multinational companies on both sides to help the company to conquer new market, to own innovations, as well as help the companies to set up the technology and product roadmap. And have internal R&D together with CVC, VC, or open innovation. Together, we can have a holistic coverage for innovation pipelines. We can not only, I think in the future world, nobody can make everything by its own. It's a connected world, it's an ecosystem. We want to do the things we are good at and we want to absorb the best art outside, for example, in China or in Asia, that combines the beauties for two parts, deliver the best product in the fast time and with the lowest cost. 
Okay, now talk, generally talk about like big multinational companies, we won't have a VC or CVC. And then late, last slide talk about we can really deliver values if we have VCs or CVCs. Now I'm giving you a very specific example, which is my work at British American Tobacco. And we we are fun, we are ALP or a fund in Shanghai called CM Venture. And here is basically the day-to-day -day work. If you really want to know like being an LP of a waste fund in China, what kind of activities they will do for you, what kind of values they will do for you. Here, uh, is, here is a very vivid example. So basically like for every year, this waste fund, they are committed to deliver several kinds of services for us. Let me go over them quickly one by one. Firstly, as LP, we attend their deal flow session. So we, they want to incorporate, they want to hear us on their financial decisions. And they also want to hear us, do we see any linkage between the portfolio companies or the companies they want to invest with our business? Do we see synergies? They want to hear from us. And also they want us to, to attend their investment committee and uh, advisor committee meetings as a high level. They want to see like how the LPs for example, BET is LP, Dow Chemical, BSF, we're all LPs for one company. And they want us to talk together and say, do we, can we collaborate or not? Actually, <coughs> for now, BET is talking with, with Subic. Subic is also LP for that fund. We'll talk about some potential collaborations because of these uh, meetings. And the so next is what we call a scouting project. And we ask because of VC fund, they have some special, they have some expert, and they have a big database, and they know a lot of ecosystem in China. So we ask them to deliver a lot of consulting reports to us. For example, in the last year, they actually worked on four projects for us: haters, 3D printing, uh, tobacco, and some other things. And they deliver some excellent report to us, and also connected some really really first first two industrial innovations to us. And we are now engaging with the companies to try to absorb their technologies and also potentially invest into some of the companies. So to, to, summary, to summarize, what kind of values for being LP or with Fund in China can deliver to multinational companies? I think three key things. Firstly, we can attend deal flow session to know more companies. And we can ask the, LPs to the GPs to listen to the LPs when they make the the financial decision. And also the LPs, the GPs can probably do the scouting and foresight to provide vis visibilities to LPs on the local innovations tailored on our needs. And thirdly, I think also critical is that most of the VC funds in China, some of them have very, some of them are very technical driven. Some of them has a huge database. So they probably can enable the big corporate to be the first to know Assuming like sometimes it's actually a competition of time. If you know the technology earlier than others, probably you can be the winner. And the VCs, it can be your eyes. And it can be the bridge to help you to connect with these companies. And because these VCs, they have a big database, sometimes they can help you to establish, to establish your ecosystem. I think that's something also important for the multinational company in China to consider, not only to help to partner with one company, probably we can partner with the, the companies like being your customer, as a company being your supplier, somehow you can build a, your own ecosystem. And having that ecosystem, you can drive the innovation from like from early stage to later stage much quickly. And now we talk about like, we won't have a VC. VC do bring value. And then and at the, at the operational level, what kind of activities the VCs can help the LPs in China. And lastly, I want to give you a little bit of thoughts, my personal thoughts like, if you want to set up a VC or CVCs in China, where do you want to set it up? I think in China, we, we, we actually categorize the cities into different tiers. And we call tier one city, so basically the, the biggest city with the best economy. And in China, we now generally people think that's three tier one cities, Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. So if you want to set up a VC or services, I think you probably won't set up in the tier one city. And let me go through the cities one by one. The, each of them has their own beauties has, and also there, there are a little bit problems. So firstly to Beijing, I think Beijing is our capital. It's a political center. That's a good part. And also sometimes it's a bad part because it's very much politicized. A lot of decisions are being made based on political things. But but itself, most of AI companies, startup companies are actually very condensed in China. 
and the best universities in China called the Peking University and Tsinghua, they are both in Beijing. And there are 200 plus multinational companies. For example, I think Mercedes, their headquarters also in Beijing. And for the Chinese start tech startup, 36% are based in Beijing. So it's a big ecosystem already in Beijing. And it's number two worldwide for the venture capital investment inside in, in the world, Beijing. Second one, Shanghai, that's the city where Robin and I live. I think Shanghai is considered the biggest economic city in China. It's a China economic hub. And it has the relatively even industrial distribution, talking about fast moving consumer goods, life science, chemical, et cetera. So it's quite, it's quite even across different sectors. And then we also have a world's, two of the best universities in China, Fudan, and as well as Jiaotong. And another thing I want to mention about Shanghai is uh, as a foreigner, I think Shanghai is probably the easiest city for you to live. Most people can speak English easily. As you can see, like there are more than 700 companies, their headquarters, the Asian or China headquarters based in Shanghai. So Shanghai is really good at absorbing foreign investment. Talk about Chinese tech startup, a quarter of them are in Shanghai. And Shanghai is also kind of like very big venture capital city. It's at least number six in the whole world based on the report of 2021. And next one, I'll talk about Shenzhen. Shenzhen is really a booming city. Like Beijing, Shanghai has been there for many years. Shenzhen is really booming. 30 years ago, it's nothing. Now it's the third biggest economy in China. BYD is in Shenzhen. Huawei is in Shenzhen. Tencent is also in Shenzhen. So Shenzhen is really changing the whole thing. Not only their own economy, is also changing China. And also Shenzhen is really industry. If we talk about manufacturing, yeah, that's Shenzhen. Shenzhen really a, a lot of manufacturing innovations. There are also some good, good universities in Shenzhen. And Shenzhen is so close to Hong Kong. So can, you can also absorb the, the, you know, the finance, the, the money, as well as the, the talents from Hong Kong. And also there are already many companies moving from Beijing, Shanghai to Shenzhen. And talking about the tech startups, 12% are in Shenzhen. And Shenzhen also listed with the top 20 cities for venture capital investment. So here's my last slide. So overall, my message I want to deliver to you is, as a multinational company, we need to consider VC and CVCs, especially in China. And VC and CVCs do bring value to us. And if you really want to do something in China, I want you to consider Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Okay, that's pretty, pretty much my part. I will be happy to answer any question you have later. Thank you.